Okay, so if folks want to um, pull up H546, or I'm not sure, Eric, if you will be sharing your screen or not, whatever works for you, but um, that is what we will be looking at. So committee, we're gonna be um, doing the walkthrough today, and then we will start with, uh, with our witnesses tomorrow afternoon. So, folks have, uh, let me know when everybody has what they, what they need in terms of 546. And Eric, did you wanna share your uh, screen? What, what works for you? Yeah, I think that makes sense if that's uh, okay with you, Maxine. Sure. Whatever. sure. Yeah, but if the committee has a preference, I'm okay with that too, whatever, whatever you prefer. No, go ahead, go ahead, share your screen. Oh, yeah. And uh, okay, so, so welcome, Eric. Thank you. I should I go ahead now or? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, great, all right, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here to do a walkthrough uh, of H546 for the committee. That's an act relating to racial justice statistics. My first time appearing before the committee this year, I think, so it's good to see everybody. Uh, you know, you've been at it for a while, but I've been down in Senate Judiciary pretty exclusively uh, on a number of bills, which I'm sure I will be working with, with you on later on this year. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I haven't seen you all yet. So great to see you. Um, the uh, uh, bill we're working on now before I switch to my, or maybe as I switch to my screen chair, I'll uh, make a couple of comments about it, but uh, it should seem familiar to everybody because uh, we worked on it in committee last year as well. And you may recall that uh, the judiciary, the miscellaneous judiciary procedures bill last year, which was S97, that when it was signed by the governor, it was Act 65. Uh, that bill uh, contained some direction about this topic, the uh, what was then called the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. And what S97 um, did was it instructed uh, the Racial Disparities in Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Panel, RDAP, to report on this issue back to you all uh, by last fall. So the idea was that they were going to look more at this topic to um, study where the uh, Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics or whatever it would be named would be located, where it would be situated uh, as an entity, how it would be staffed, what its mission would be, et cetera. So the bill you're looking at now H-546 is based on RDAP's work and their report, which they made uh, earlier, actually last year now. Uh, so that's sort of the genesis of it. And before I start in my walkthrough, I should probably give a quick staffing bit of background in that um, uh, I am pinch hitting today uh, for Amrin, the attorney in our office who works on uh, government operations issues. So she was the one who actually drafted this bill and worked on it with the sponsors. And I'm probably going to be taking it over to the extent that it's in the Judiciary Committee because the government ops committees are busy with other subjects that Amron is busy with. So I'm going to probably pick it up from here on in. But so some of the background questions that uh, might or might come up that I would ordinarily have an answer to, I might not and might defer to the sponsors on that, on some of those, because as I say, I didn't actually put this draft together. I can certainly do the walkthrough. Um, but as far as some of those sort of context questions or questions about why certain directions were chosen. I'm going to defer to others on that. So uh, with that, by way of background, let's take a look at what H546 says. The first topic that it's addressing here, right here on page one, is one that you may remember was discussed at length last year, which was where should this entity be situated? Where would, should it be in-state government? Should it be outside state government? Should it be a standalone entity of some sort? What's the right uh, place for it to be located and to be stood up. And the, the proposal that the bill makes is that essentially you'll see right now the executive director of racial equity uh, sits, is situated within the agency of administration. It's sort of a standalone uh, position within AOA, the agency of administration. So what the bill proposes to do is to uh, create uh, an office of racial equity. So you would then have the office of racial, racial equity and within that office, are two different entities. The existing, you see line 14, page one there, the existing ED of racial equity would be within the Office of 
racial equity, as would the newly created Division of Racial Justice Statistics that we're about to take a look at. So you'd have the Office of Racial Equity and within it, two different um, entities slash bodies, the ED of Racial Equity and the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. So that's the proposal for how this would be set up. And you'll see that um, uh, the executive directors has a role with respect to the uh, division, and that's an oversight role. That's on line 18 that you see there. The director shall oversee the division. So in addition to sort of this moving around organizationally, you also have uh, the director's role being expanded to the extent that it involves an oversight role over this newly created division. So naturally, um, excuse, actually, sorry, excuse me, Eric. Um, Ken yeah. is waving, and um, and again, when we screen share, sometimes it's hard for me to see folks. So, um, so jump in if I don't call on you. Um, go ahead, Ken. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it, just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, the we um, the executive executive director already that's Susanna's uh, job, correct? Yes, and we're correct. looking. What I'm sorry. I just said, yes, that's correct. Okay, and we're looking to possibly expand on that, build um, what I assume the administration wants in this, in this area? Uh, that's the part I have not been involved in. I, I don't know what the, what the um, uh, administration's take on this is. Okay, thank you. So uh, kind of segueing off uh, that question, one might sort of an obvious one that sort of arises. Okay, well, if the director has oversight authority over division, what does that mean exactly? What, is, what does the oversight role entail? And uh, conveniently, the next three subdivisions exactly state <laughs> what that oversight role would entail. So what would the director do with respect to the, this newly established division? Well, they would have, you see line one there, they would have general charge over the division, may employ employees as necessary, Subdivision two, they, in consultation with RDAP, they can hire a deputy director to oversee the, the division. And they also, subdivision three may apply for grant funding um, to sort of advance the divisions uh, and duties and responsibilities. So that's the, the role of the ED, the existing ED of racial equity with respect to the division. So then you get into, all right, well, what, is, what does the division itself do? And that's subchapter two, this, this is where the, the Division of Racial Justice Statistics is created, uh, what its purpose is, is laid out, what it does, its legal charge is all detailed um, when it, with a great deal of specificity in this subchapter two. So first thing that happens is it's created, you have to have it statutorily created, and that's what is done here in uh, section 5011. It's created within the Office of Racial Equity. So you see that, as I mentioned earlier, you have this Office of Racial Equity, um, that includes both the executive director and the division, and they are both within that office. And the division is created to, and this is very similar to the language you looked at last year, to collect and analyze data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice system. So this overarching uh, uh, purpose is then sort of expanded upon in subsection B, where you have some specific language about the mission and purpose of the division. The first sentence has to do with the mission. It says its mission is to collect and analyze data relating to racial disparities with the intent to center racial equity throughout these efforts. So that's your mission, your overall mission. The purpose is to create, promote, and advance a system and structure that provides access to appropriate data and information, ensuring that privacy interests are protected and principles of transparency and accountability are clearly expressed. So you have this broad mission statement and articulation of purpose here. And, the, and lastly, in that subsection, uh, clarifies that the data are to be used to inform policy decisions. So what's the purpose of creating this data? To inform policy decisions that work toward the amelioration of racial disparities across various systems of state government. So, um, as I say, this, this subsection is really the, the very overarching broad mission statement and articulation of the purpose of the division. Um, and that, uh, as I say, is a broad statement. And that, then you move into section 5012, which is a specific statement. This, you get from that uh, general uh, articulation of the purpose to a 
a section that lays out the specific statutory duties of the division. And that's what you have in 5012. Okay, what, what exactly is division supposed to do? And, you know, it's a lengthy list. Uh, and uh, as I say, uh, or as the chair mentioned, I also can't see folks because I'm sharing the screen. So please, and I tend to, you know, move along fairly quickly. So if anyone has any questions, please do interrupt me uh, and let me know if you want me to either slow down or stop for a moment so that we can answer a question or talk about a particular piece of language a little more uh, in detail. So uh, the duties of the division are laid out here uh, quite clear clearly. There's a, a numbered list that begins on line 13. The first one is to work collaboratively with and have the assistance of all state and local agencies and departments So this collaborative work with other entities of government for purposes of collecting all data related to, you know, that ties you back to, to the uh, mission and purpose because it's all data related to systemic racial bias and disparities uh, within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Uh, duty number two, collect and analyze data. So they, they're going to work collaboratively with these agencies in subdivision one, subdivision two, they have to collect and analyze the data. And this is the data that we're just talking about related to this systemic bias. Subdivision three, uh, conduct justice information sharing gap analysis. So this analysis of where gaps exist in this uh, justice information uh, universe out there. Moving on, there's a, a requirement that the division maintain an inventory of justice technology assets and a data dictionary to identify elements and structure of databases and relationships, if any, to other databases. So division five, we develop a justice technology strategic plan. So that's an also a duty of the agency. And this is, has to be updated annually. Plan is, has to include identification and prioritization of data needs and requirements to fulfill new or emerging uh, research proposals and operational enhancements. Now you also have to make recommendations under subdivision six for designing and implementing interfaces and other technology solutions that are going to address uh, the needs that are identified in their strategic plan, which we just mentioned. It's also going to be required to develop interagency agreements and MOUs, memorandums of understanding for data sharing and, uh, and to publish public use files. There's a re two reporting requirements in subdivisions eight and nine. Um, the first one is a monthly reporting requirement to the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council. This is the oversight body over the division that's also created in this bill. You may remember we talked about a similar concept last year. So in addition to this division that we're looking at right now, which does the day-to-day -day data collection and analysis, there's also an oversight body uh, known as the, the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council that uh, interacts with the division, that uh, makes policy recommendations to the division, analyzes the data that the, that the division um, creates and forwards. And so every month, the division of just collecting this data has to report its data analysis and recommendations to the advisory council. And we'll talk a little bit later on about exactly who the advisory council is, who it's composed of, and, and what its duties are. But uh, one thing as we are looking at here that the division has to do is send their data and their other information to the council every month. Now, annually, this is subdivision nine, there's another reporting requirement annually, and this one is to you, uh, to the justice, sorry, the judiciary committees and the government operations committees. Each year, the division has to report its data analysis and recommendations to you folks. So you'll get an annual report in January or on or before January 15th of every year as well. Uh, the uh, Last subsection on this page, subsection B, is rulemaking, rulemaking authority. So you see that the division has uh, is given rulemaking authority under uh, the administrative, the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act, which is the citation you see there, 3 VSA Chapter 25. So it has to go through the standard rulemaking process that I know um, the committee is familiar with, uh, but it is provided with this authority. And you'll see how important that is, uh, in particular, when we get to the next section. And this is section 5013 
data governance. You know, what do they do with this data? How do they collect it? Who do they give it to? What, you know, that sort of thing is all addressed in this section of the bill. And you'll see the very first thing, lines two and three, the division shall establish by rule the data to be collected to carry out the duties of this subject. Now, you re may remember in the, in the bill that the committee looked at last year, the data to be collected was specified. There was, a, there was a lengthy, actually a couple of different lengthy lists of the type of data of uh, related to racial justice and uh, criminal juvenile justice uh, and criminal justice statistics uh, laid out quite in detail that described the different stages of the criminal and juvenile processes. And you know that was the, the list of what data the division was required to collect. Here, the bill takes a, a different approach and says, the division's going to establish by rule what data should be collected. So it's got to go through the rulemaking process. It'll it'll uh, be proposed in uh, the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. LCAR will have a chance to look at it. Um, so you'll the the collection, the type of data that should be uh, collected by the division by rule will come back to the legislature in that way. So subdivision one uh, makes clear that the data that's collected uh, according to these duties are not public records. So they're not going to be uh, available for uh, information, Freedom of Information Act requests, for example, under the public records law. Instead, their they're, they're release, you see that's line six, is governed by the data sharing agreements or MOUs um, and that they themselves will be public use files, but the data itself uh, is not a public record that can be um, obtained, generally speaking, by members of the public. Now, an obvious question that might arise is, well, how did the division get, how do they get this data? Well, one way you'll see subdivide, specified, specified subdivision two is division shall be granted access to the data of any state agency or department it designates by rule as necessary for the division to perform the requirements and objectives of this chapter. So think about that process. What that's saying is that um, if there's sort of a, a preliminary step that has to be taken, and that step is that the division has to, by rule, again, this goes back to the rulemaking process, by rule, the division has to um, designate a state agency or department um, for purposes of uh, uh, gaining access to the data that it needs to perform uh, what it is required to do under this chapter, subject. So uh, if an agency is not designated by rule the way I read that, then there would not be this mandatory access because you see it shall in line eight, division shall be granted access. So it's uh, a requirement that the division be provided with access to this data so long as uh, the division designates that particular state agency uh, in its rules as necessary um, for their, their duties. Now, if it's not a state actor, that's the second sentence you see. But what about a non-state entity? Well, in that case, uh, they they can they may remember. See, that's not a shall. They may access a non-state entity's data as long as they have a data sharing agreement or an MOU with that entity. So uh, that way, that sets up a structure for them to do that um, voluntarily uh, to provide that data to uh, the division through that sort of a, like I say, an MOU or, or a sharing agreement. All right. Yeah. I have a quick question on our line, uh, be line four and I'm on data collected the subchapter is not public records. Uh, I see where they give <clears throat> the office uh, that protection. However, subsequently, the law enforcement entities that release this information uh, to this office, are they subject to this as a public records request? Well, they would be, uh, they, they presumably, they have the data themselves. Yep. Uh, so they would then be governed by their own uh, statutes and rules related to whether the data is uh, public record or not. Um, you know, so if someone made, in other words, the, the very the simple the act of transferring it to the division, you know, the way it's you're looking at in line four is not going to change the law enforcement entities' obligations with respect to their own data. So this would only be um, once the once the division has it, 
that means that it doesn't just doesn't become public by virtue of the division having it. You can't just go to, you know, for example, if it was if it was um, uh, confidential and not a public record under a law enforcement agency's own statute and rules, then it's not going to be become public just because they provide it to the division. So it's, it's still the entity's own internal and statutory responsibilities that that'll govern that. So that wouldn't change. Okay. So individual law enforcement entities are not protected under this. Uh, I'm not sure I, I understand what you mean by protected. If you've got ten law enforcement entities that have to provide these records to the Office of Racial uh, Equity or whatever we're calling this, right? FOIA requests go into those ten agencies to release those records, which kind of circumvent the whole process. Well, there, there, the law already exists with respect to the, I mean, if somebody's trying to see those records, if they're confidential now, then they'll remain confidential. That, that, that isn't changed by this at all. Okay, I'm still confused what, what's referred to as confidential, what's not, but thank you. Yeah. Eric, can yeah. you let Celine, Representative Coburn in? She's in the waiting room. Uh, and I'm apparently sure you're the host. I just have to switch him to co-host real quick. He was made co-host. Um, It'll just take a moment. All set. Great, thank you. So I believe we were on um, subdivision three and we're going through the, the statutory uh, duties of the division. And number three uh, uh, sets out that the division uh, has to work with the agency of Div digital services on the collection and retention of data, data governance and data security issues. And, they, and the division may contract with a third party vendor for storage management and retention of data if recommended by the Agency of Digital Services. So if the Agency of Digital Services recommends it, then, then the division can contract out uh, the storage management and retention of data to a third party. Now, subdivision four actually goes back to the, to the very first one we looked at. Remember, the very top, we, we noticed that uh, we were looking at that the uh, lines two and three, that the first duty of the division that's laid out, that the, the division has to establish by rule the data to be collected to carry out the duties of the subchapter. So what data is going to be collected has to be uh, identified in rule. Now, subdivision four says uh, that when the division is doing this, or when the division is establishing which data is to be collected, uh, they have to consult with RDAP and the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council, which I mentioned earlier, the oversight body over the division. So the division, in other words, isn't by itself uh, deciding what data is to be collected. It has to do it in consultation with both RDAP and the Advisory Council. Uh, all right, so that, that was the duties of uh, you said data collection. So that was all the data collection duties. Now there's also data analysis. So once the uh, division collects this data, it has to analyze it, and it has to analyze it with several goals in mind that you see listed three goals laid out there to identify the stages of the criminal and juvenile justice systems at which racial bias and disparities are most likely to occur. So the data will inform that identification. Uh, to two, they have to analyze the data to organize and synthesize it in a cohesive and logical manner so that it can best be presented and understood. And uh, they have to present the data to uh, the, the advisory council as required under the subject. Remember, we talked about that a couple of minutes ago. There's a monthly reporting requirement that the division has to, has to do with respect to the advisory council. Every month they have to uh, report the data that they've collected, the analysis, analyses they've made, et cetera. And so uh, this lays that, uh, puts some specifics on that. You know, what does that report have to include? has to be this, this data that they've collected has to be presented 
in that report. Uh, the division also has to uh, develop and adopt a data governance policy. Uh, and that is, in other words, a policy that governs the, the data that they've collected. And uh, this has to establish a, a system or systems to standardize. So this is standardization required in subdivision one, standardize the collection and retention of the data. And two, methods to permit sharing and communications of the data between the state agencies, local agencies, and external researchers. Um, it's sort of connected to this. You'll see the next subsection D, data retention, that the division has to recommend uh, to the state and local agencies evidence-based practices and standards for collection and retention of racial justice data. So you can think of that as sort of a back and forth, because remember, we just went through the fact that that the uh, division, that these state and local agencies who have this data are going to be required to send it to the division, uh, as long as the division identifies them uh, by rule. But there's a back and forth in the sense that you know uh, these entities with the data have to send it to the division, but the division also here has to recommend to the agencies um, best practices, evidence-based practices and standards for collection and retention. So you can think of that as kind of a, uh, as I say, a back and forth between the division and the entities who, who collect and have this data in the first instance. Uh, there's a, uh, although the, as we were talking uh, earlier, the, the data collected are not public records, there is a, a public component of this, and that's that the division has to maintain a public facing website and a dashboard that maximizes the transparency of the division's work and ensures the ability of the public and historically impacted communities to review and understand the data that's collected. So although the, you know, the raw data isn't itself a public record, there is a requirement that transparency um, uh, be promoted here via the website and a dashboard and ensuring that public and historically impacted communities can review and understand this data. And there have to be public use data files you see in line three toward that end. Uh, so that brings us to the advisory council, which we've talked about a little bit. And now this section, 5014, talks about um, uh, what the advisory council, uh, who they are and what they do. You'll see subsection A creates it. And it's, uh, uh, it's you'll see line seven and eight also has the administrative, legal, and technical support of the agency of administration, which is where the um, executive director of racial equity is housed as well. Now, who's on it? Who's on this advisory committee? Committee um, council, sorry, not committee. You can see there are 18 members, two from the General Assembly, one appointed by the Committee on Committees and one by the Speaker. Uh, a court representative appointed by the, it's the Chief Justice or the Chief Justice's designee, Attorney General or designee, Defender General or designee, ED of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs or designee, Commissioner of Public Safety, Commissioners, uh, sorry, Commissioners of Public Safety, DCF and Corrections or their designees, as well as the Secretary of Education, ED of the Human Rights Commission or designee, individual with substantive expertise in community-based research on racial equity to be appointed by the governor. So that's a gubernatorial appointment. And then you have uh, subdivision L, which says six individuals who have experienced one or more of the following situations. And then you have some specific uh, uh, criteria that are laid out here. Uh, and they are one or more of the following situations, either facing eviction, uh, violence, discrimination, or criminal conduct, including law enforcement misconduct, moving to Vermont as an immigrant or refugee, effects of racial disparities and discipline policies within the educational system, or participation in treatment programs addressing mental health, substance abuse, and reentry programs and the last point here is that appointments made from this group uh, uh, shall be made by this list of entities. And you see this is in uh, line 16, subdivision Roman numeral six. Um, so each of these entities uh, appoint one member. Then AACP, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Migrant Justice, AALV Inc., Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, and Outright Vermont. So each of those entities, of which there are six, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six, yes, each of them makes one of the appointments. Uh, 
uh, there's some language about the qualifications of the members of the advisory council. They, uh, and you know, this language I'm sure is familiar to the committee. We've looked at this with respect to other appointments and other bodies before, similar language. Members shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interest of communities of color and other historically disadvantaged communities throughout the state. And to the extent possible, have experience working to implement racial justice reform and represent geographically diverse areas of the state. Now, the terms of the members of the council are generally four years. You see that line for it. Um, and there's just some boilerplate language uh, that follows the four year terms. It talks about how um, terms. Uh, generally are appointed, uh, sorry, members are appointed to fill expired terms um, and uh, they serve until their successors are elected or appointed. You see there's in a sense a term limit provision, lines nine and 10, members shall serve not more than two consecutive terms in any capacity. So two terms maximum. Uh, you have a chair and the members of the council elect the chair by majority vote. Um, the members are to be appointed by November 1st of this year. So that gives a few months after the uh, effective date of the act for implementation of these members. And terms officially begin on January 1st, 2023. Now the council duties are laid out here as well. Uh, the council is uh, directed to work with and assist the director or designate to implement the requirements of this chapter. So they work on implementation with the director, advise the director, to ensure compliance with the purpose of the chapter. Uh, evaluate the data and analyses received from the division. Remember, that's, that's that monthly reporting requirement that we talked about. So they get this, this monthly report with the data and analyses from the division. And then here um, is a requirement that the, that the advisory council evaluate what they receive and make recommendations to the division as a result of the evaluations. So they look it over and uh, circle back with recommendations. And they have a reporting requirement to the legislature as well. So remember, we saw that the division has an annual reporting requirement to, again, uh, the Judiciary and Government Operations Committees. And there's also a reporting requirement uh, on the part of the Advisory Council. And this report that they uh, are required to submit to you each year has to include, and this is A and B, its findings regarding racial bias and disparities within uh, the criminal and juvenile justice systems based upon the data and analysis that the council received from the division. So again, that goes back to that uh, uh, reporting system and the analysis requirements. So uh, the council gets the, gets the data and the analyses from the division. And based upon that, uh, they make findings and report them uh, to the legislature. And in addition to, to those findings, subdivision B, they also have to include a status report on progress made and recommendations for further action. So including legislative proposals. So if there's any proposed legislation, it would come from the advisory council. Uh, this these could address uh, systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Uh, the council meets monthly, they have per diem uh, pursuant to statutes. Um, and uh, that concludes that section. The section two though has to do with the implementation of the council, because remember, and this is a, a common approach that's done in legislation, is to say, well, it's essentially how do we how do we get it started, right? How's it going to get up and running? And it's specifically provided that the first meeting is going to be called uh, by the director of racial equity. So it's the director of racial equity that calls the first meeting of the council. And, but after that, all subsequent meetings are called by the chair, because remember, at that first meeting, the chair is going to get elected. Now, uh, remember that in general, the members of the council serve four-year terms. We just uh, discussed that. However, the initial terms uh, are not all gonna be four years. And that's so that, um, and this is also a common device that's used when, a, when a, a body is established for the first time. You don't necessarily want every member of the body to be appointed uh, every year to have to be reappointed every year. You want to stagger the term so that a couple of members or, or some smaller member uh, number of the of members are reappointed or newly appointed every year, and depending on whether the person is either seeking reappointment or in this case has finished their two terms that they're permitted. Uh, so you stagger it to begin with for the first 
uh, in the first instance. And the way that does it, it takes a group of the members first serve a two-year term, you see them to subdivision one, then another group serve a three-year term to start with, and uh, a small another group serves a four-year term. So you essentially you divide it up into three groups, uh, I believe six members each, and, um, and they each serve those staggered terms to start with, but then after that, they're each gonna serve the same four-year term. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we setting up a, a, a complete new, um, a new committee that basically is, is, is like what was set up for like the cannabis board? Is that what this is like following? Uh, I don't, I'm not real familiar with the, with the cannabis board, but I, uh, I think it is setting up a new entity. Yes. It's a new, a new, uh, uh, a new division within the, uh, within the office of racial equity and a new, um, advisory council that oversights them. Yeah. Those are, those are newly established in the bill. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Um, and lastly, there is an appropriation for uh, the establishment uh, of these entities that we were just talking about. Um, and this appropriation, which is uh, $539,960, about 540 approximately, this is actually, you may recall, uh, the appropriation that was used last year based on an analysis from the Joint Fiscal Office uh, that uh, the committee got, I think it was in the context when the bill was being discussed last year before it was in the miscellaneous bill. But anyway, the, the JFO fiscal analysis uh, was itself based on the idea that there was gonna be four full-time positions, an executive director, two information technology data analysts, and one administrative support person. So four positions total, uh, as well as startup costs and annual operating expenses. and, and um, JFO did an analysis, and for the for that uh, for those four positions and the other expenses I just mentioned, this was the figure that they came up with. So, can I interrupt again? I'm sorry. Yeah, please, please do. So, in this in this ap appropriation, is like I see agency of digital services is that including how much they're going to charge for the service also? Uh, I do not believe so. I do not believe that, that this appropriation uh, covers what whatever time and expense other state agencies would have to, to be working on this. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, effective date of July 1st, 2022 um, brings me to the end of my of the walkthrough. So I can either leave this up, Representative Grad, or pull the document down, whichever whichever is your preference. Yeah, how about if you um, pull it uh, down for the moment, please, so I can sure. see things. And uh, I am gonna turn to um, Coach, um, see if you have any anything that you would like to, um, to add after the walkthrough. And thank you very much, Eric. It's, Appreciate that. And then also Martin sure. as well. Yeah. Well, I'd like to start with um, Eric, incredible job. Um, you know, picking up the ball, you know, that you hadn't been designing from the beginning. <laughs> well, thank you, Representative Christie. I, I almost said I was, I was pinch hitting, but uh, as a baseball fan, pinch hitters usually strike out. So I, I hope I didn't in that particular case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you made your salary this year, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, so basically, uh, I think one of the, a couple of things to think about. We just heard the report from Justice Reinvestment Two, and remember, one of their key findings was the need for a bureau of racial statistics in Vermont. That was a key finding of Justice Reinvestment too. We had started working on this proposal last year. 
uh, at the beginning of the biennium uh, with uh, uh, 317, uh, which was creating, you know, that that entity. Uh, that's why some of the budget numbers were uh, available, uh, and a lot of the design was available as well. One of the the other uh, interesting things, and you know, I I've, I actually created a graphic to show, you know, some of this uh, interconnectedness. And what I mean by that, if you go to the uh, enabling statute that set up the Office of Racial Equity, okay, and and you know I'll we'll call it the office versus the person, but you know for those who might not recall, that's Susanna Davis's office. When the legislature created that office, part of that office is job was to analyze racial statistics across all entities of state government, all, not a couple departments, not one or two, all, you know, and it was very specific. Needless to say, in our creation as a legislature, we almost created um, some directions that we knew we'd have to fill in along the way because we, we, we never really staffed that office to do the work that we asked it to do. And that's why I think that um, when Justice Reinvestment looked at the data components, it became very clear to them that we needed to get to that work. Um, so, so anyways, you know, there's a couple of, um, you know, clarifying pieces that we can address as we go, you know, simple things like uh, instead of executive director of the bureau, a suggestion would be director of the division because the division is part of the office. So rather than having an executive director and an executive director, you know, twice, you know, uh, in that office, it would make sense to have the executive director of racial equity and then have a division director of racial statistics. You know, just, just to not um, confuse you know, the, uh, the chain of command, so to speak. Uh, but we can address that, you know, after we hear more uh, testimony. Um, I, I really believe that, um, you know, we're on the right path. Um, we'll hear from witnesses, you know, across state government, you know, over the next, uh, you know, couple of uh, uh, interactions you know, on this bill, and hopefully they'll be able to support that. You know, after everybody gets done, Madam Chair, um, you know, with their, you know, Martin, and then other, you know, questions, um, I can make an attempt to show you that, uh, that little map that I put together that shows, you know, how things are actually connected. Uh, and, you know, it might be able to help from a visual perspective once we're done with that. Thank you very much. Martin, did you have? Did yeah, you have you know, I, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments and, and I, I did actually have a question for Eric. That, uh, <clears throat> um, so just, uh, I'm, I've asked Amber to post uh, the two RDAP reports, the one from this past uh, November, which led, directly to this document, to this bill, and then the one that was posted in December of uh, 2020, uh, which also relates to this. Uh, uh, so folks can can take a look at that. That should be getting up. It's probably not up yet. I just sent it to her. Uh, but it's the two reports from RDAP really that relate to this. Um, the, question, the question I have, a little precursor for the question first. Um, but this is one of the issues I'm going to I'm going to want to certainly get some input from the witnesses, because 
there, there are some choices that have been made in this initial draft uh, that we do want to uh, raise with the, the committee and, and with, with the, the witnesses. And that was how much directive there is from the legislature as far as how this should be done versus how much discretion should be provided to the entity that we're creating to, to do this work. And we've leaned more towards the discretion side of this. Uh, although we do have, you know, certainly a rulemaking uh, that is part of this process that the division would undertake to decide which data uh, to obtain. Um, but th this is one question I'm going to have is, you know, do we need any more detail? And, and I actually have some suggestions uh, for folks to, to consider when we get into the testimony. Uh, but I'll leave that uh, for, for tomorrow. But the, the question I have uh, is more specific for you, Eric, and that's um, with respect to the rulemaking, and I'm looking specifically at page five, where we talk about the division shall be granted access to the data of any state agency or department. It designates by rule as necessary for the division to perform the requirements and objectives of this subchapter. Um, when we say state agency or department, or then it goes on, I'm sorry, it says the division may access the data of a non-state entity pursuant to a data sharing agreement or memorandum of understanding with the entity. So what I'm thinking particularly is that we have a number of entities that would be involved in this. It could be sheriff's departments, but, but I'm thinking more of the courts, a completely separate, uh, separate uh, branch of government, uh, the various state's attorneys, et cetera, and presumably that's what we mean when we talk about uh, data sharing agreements or memoranda. Um, do we need to have more of a legislative dictate to require, and can we require the court, for instance, to provide the data uh, that's deemed necessary under this rule? Or is it going to simply be very much a matter of the court be you know agreeing to a data sharing agreement. Do you understand the question? I'm just wondering if we need to be a little more uh, directive yeah. uh, with respect to some of those other entities. If not the court, then state's attorneys, for instance. I mean, I'm not anticipating that we're going to have an issue, but who knows? Uh, is it better to 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 be more directive? Can we be more directive? I think you can be. I'm just thinking of. You know, it seems pretty common for the legislature, for example, to require the court to make various reports and uh, include data in its reports of different kinds to whether it be to the legislature or to other bodies. Uh, so I think there is a uh, precedent for, for um, statutorily requiring the court to uh, provide information and data. So, Te you know, speaking technically, might someone in the court conceivably raise a separation of powers argument? I, I suppose it's possible, but uh, I haven't heard about that with respect to at least information production. Um, but I see what you're saying. You might be, you might, it might be advisable to make that uh, information production requirement more explicit. Well, well, it could be just a matter of uh, one of our favorite words that we kick around here in Judiciary Committee is whether we use the word may or shall. And perhaps it's as simple as on line 10 of page five that the, the division shall access the data of a non-state entity pursuant to the data sharing or pursuant to data sharing agreements. If we, if we change that to a shall, does that not then obligate the non-state agencies to comply? or to enter those agreements, or at least I'm, I'm raising that, you know, that's probably more detail than we need to get in right now, but, but just something to think about. Well, I had wondered with that one as to whether or not, you know, I guess I don't know who the non-state entities might be, but it occurred to me that perhaps that was a may because if it were a private entity, then you probably couldn't require them to produce it. That's probably why it's a may. Um, you know, so they might least, argue. It may need to be fin finessed a little bit more, but that is a, you know, a question I'm throwing out there that we probably need to ponder a little bit. Excuse yes, me, Mar right. Martin and uh, Eric. Um, one of the, the, uh, the pieces 
that are actually already in statute, uh, potentially with the, uh, the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, in that statute, it says specifically, pursuant to section 2102 of this title, the director shall work, shall, using the termination, shall work collaboratively with state agencies and departments to greater relevant existing data and records necessary to carry out the purpose of this chapter. And that was the data integration piece that is already in statute that is under the jurisdiction of the office versus the division. So um, there's a nexus that occurs, you know, in that area. So anyways, it, it, it was a thought. I, I still think it doesn't quite get us to the non, <clears throat> non-state agencies. No, 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 not, not, but everybody else that's right. under that, that part of the umbrella you know you know we've we've got a hole in the umbrella you know but we can we can find a way to to cover that one yeah we like to assist, yeah we can bookmark that um we, we do have quite a few witnesses tomorrow and possibly into friday and next week um so we can also keep these questions in mind uh ken go ahead no, i i i just trying to um, trying to to um, understand this. We are already. This legislature is very um. They don't like data data sh shared. Now. You basically want to pull any data that you want, whether it's from a private or public entity, to go and do what you want. Is it that? Is it that kind of talking out of both sides of our mouths? So, um, Ken, I'm gonna. It sounds like a policy discussion for the committee, unless you're asking if that. If you're asking Eric if that is how it is reads is from a drafting perspective. Sure, I'm asking Eric. Thank you. Yeah, I can't answer that. Sorry. <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, I'm not sure what other statutes you might be referring to, so I, I, I don't have the ability to answer that one. Sorry. Okay. And and Ken again, um, we're gonna have quite a few witnesses that that may or may not raise that, but certainly, uh, you know, keep that, keep that question in your mind to, to, ask the, to ask the witnesses. Tom. Thank you. Uh, first off, Eric, you said something about pinch hitter, hitting and uh, uh, pinch hitters usually strike out. Now let's not forget the 1988 World Series, in the first game of the World Series when uh, Kirk Gibson hit that home run in the bottom of the ninth as a pinch hitter. <laughs> True. There's um, always an exception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so I, I guess I'm a little confused. So, so uh, and maybe you can uh, interrupt me, Eric, if I, if I get off, uh, you know, and I'm making some not, I guess not wrong statements, but if I'm off on the wrong track. So, um, so right now we have, I believe we have some entities in the state that at some point we mandated collect information around racial, uh, I guess you could say disparities. Is, is, is that pretty much uh, uh, true? Yeah, I think that's correct. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I wanna go kind of slow here. Um, <laughs> so when we mandated these entities, we, we just told them to collect it and not do anything with it. 
Uh, I'm not 100% sure the answer to that. I, okay. I, I only, be, okay. Only because I'm, I just haven't looked into it. Um, right. So I'm not sure. I know the collection is required. I'm not sure off the top of my head what, what the data is done with after that. Right. Well, well, I'm guess, well I guess I'm, I'm guessing that because we're at this point uh, to take, to recollect the data um, by another entity and, and as kind of a, a clearinghouse type thing, I guess. And and, and kind of to go back to what Ken said about uh, uh, government agencies and, and uh, getting them to share information and that type of thing. I, I brought this up the other day, uh, talking with a couple members that uh, 10, 10 or 12 years ago, um, we had that same issue in the human services division in, in the uh, uh, in the state. I was on human services back then. And there was, uh, and I don't remember the exact details on it, but I do remember there was a lot of uh, divisions within human services that, that weren't talking to each other and weren't sharing information with each other. And the term used back then was uh, breaking down the silos to get everybody to talk to each other. Um, and I kind of see this as, as maybe something similar, uh, getting all these entities to break down their silos to get all the information into one place. And I, I, I don't know if we're reinventing the wheel here uh, from what was done uh, 10 or 12 years ago in human services. And, and I really think it would be worth looking at to see if uh, if that's a process that, that could be used here or not. Um, I know there's a lot of people uh, still in the building that were around back then. Um, what, what David uh, Iacovoni was commissioner back then, so uh, he would know a lot about it. Um, and there's certainly members, uh, uh, Floyd Neese is another one who was uh, involved in human services back then. Uh, if not, maybe he might have been DCF, but um, I mean, and a lot of members of the legislature or a few members of the legislature that were uh, really involved in that whole process, along with uh, Chair Pugh, uh, uh, Ann Donahue, uh, Mike Merwicki. Um, these are all people who would have uh, potentially have knowledge on that process um, in, in, uh, in whether or not we could adopt it to what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Yeah. See, uh, if, if I may, uh, what Tom's referring to too, over that period of time, we were trying to break down those. Remember Tom, you, you know, we, every time that somebody would say, well, this, agency doesn't talk to this one this one doesn't talk to that one but if you were talking about a kid wouldn't you want to be able to get data from school and from dcf you remember that you know that was one of the dilemmas that we had you know back back then when we were having some of those data discussions you know so in actuality they've cleaned a lot of that up because over you know over that time they started to do these data sharing agreements that are referred to you know like in this you know in this legislation uh, is it where we'd all want it to be nah not yet quite but at least it's heading in the right direction you know so that experience like you said Tom uh, could be pretty helpful especially from like Ampu and Bill Lippert and those guys. Their, you know, their committees. Great, Martin. I'll let you have the um, last question, and uh, certainly look forward to our witnesses to tomorrow, who hopefully will address uh, these questions. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, th this was just a little bit of a follow-up. That the the trick here is that we have, and I, what I, one of the main. Yeah, hey, I'll let them know. Questions. Right. I think you're still unmuted. There. Sorry, sorry. That that one of the question I had as far as being able to get data from the court, for instance, is that this is a situation where we have different entities, much more so than like just within one agency. It's you know the courts, the state's attorneys, the defender's office, 
uh, could have some data from DCF actually going into this. So it's really aggregating that data together. And we do have some good witnesses. That, uh, I think we'll be able to help answer that question that Tom had as well over the next uh, few days. So that's all I had, thanks. Great, okay. All right, thank you. I am gonna, um, I'm gonna stop this discussion for now. Um, Cause like I said, we do have quite a few witnesses um, that hopefully will answer these uh, questions. And uh, Eric, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, that, was, that was great. Appreciate it. Good. Um, okay, so um, committee in the last uh, few minutes we have, I know we're supposed to adjourn at 345. Um, it may take us a little longer. I have a meeting at four with uh, DCF that I'll, I'll need to go to. So hopefully we can, um, we can go back to the Center for Crime Victim Services and uh, discuss uh, proposal that um, Barbara put together just for discussion purposes, a, um, a draft memo. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you wanna um, email it to us or um, I don't know, Tom, did you have a, a chance? Have you seen, do you have a chance to look at it? I know I certainly wanna make sure that we um, capture um, your preference of um, I, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to look at it. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Barbara, why don't you email it to us, and that might be the easiest way to do it. Just to email it to House Judiciary, unless you can screen, unless you want to um, share your screen. Or I'll email it quick. Okay. I could, sorry. <laughs> I don't. I yeah. probably could. Well, it's on my. I was doing it on my laptop, and I'm. I'm on with my iPad so that I could be writing while I did this. So I'll email it right now. Okay. And it's just a draft to get us started here. Great. All right. So nice to see everybody. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Eric. You Stay too. Eric, see you at the bottom of the ninth next week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. See ya. And uh, I believe Amber is part of the House Judiciary Group, and so that way Amber can um, can put it on our website. And also, we want to make sure that uh, Jennifer and Carol get it. So you know what? I'm going to email it to the two of you right now, but then it will also be on our our website, so um, so the public can see it as well. Let me know if people just got. I just got the copy. I said myself. It. Okay. Good. Give you um, a few minutes to uh, to read it, everybody. Yeah, the I piece know. I was concerned with is is, is in here. Um, okay, it could use a little bit of an edit, which I'm sure Will is already on. I'm seeing some stuff already, but. Uh. And I, just a, a question, Dan's not here, but maybe Carol or, or Jennifer might be able to help me. So, so if, if the money doesn't come from ARPA and it comes out of the general fund, um, the money in the general fund has got to come from somewhere because that's 
the amount of the general fund is already set, right? So, so would it be uh, um, basically shuffling money around and say if, if somebody uh, in their department had extra money, uh, you know, money left over in their budget, would it, would it come from things like that? Isn't that House Appropriations' job to sort of sort out where it comes from? No, no, I, and I realize that, but I, I just wondering if that's the basic uh, uh, process that's used. Following from Daniel, who's not here today, Representative Burt, uh, Burt, and this is Jennifer Pullman again for the record from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. My understanding was that there was going to be more of a we look at the general fund since he had testified that it was doing better than expected. So perhaps it wouldn't be a shuffling, but maybe there are these um, pieces that weren't otherwise allocated, but um, I don't have the memo in front of me. Um, it didn't come through, but as far as whether it's ARPA funds or general funds, um, we just want to keep the doors open and we're right, no, to that, support. You, you answered my question because okay. I, uh, I did forget about the part where he said that the, uh, the the revenues are up a little bit in the general fund. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, uh, uh, Tom, the the difference in timing was the July report that we got, fiscal analysis report that we got um, from the Economist, was at almost like a, a parity level. It was like operating uh, flat as far as revenues. The report he gave December um, 4th or whatever date that, that was that he did the presentation. You know, I went back to my notes and he was saying that the general revenues alone were operating at almost 5.6% higher, you know, so you take 5.6%, you know, of a seven, you know, billion dollar budget, you know, that's a big chunk of, you know, uh, on the revenue side. But, but if you go back to the, um, um, to that fiscal um, uh, presentation uh, that he made uh, uh, in December, um, there was some pretty poignant uh, pieces of information, you know, around the operation of our revenue picture. And I think that's, you know, that's what Dan was getting at, too. The, you know, the only problem is because, you know, JFO has been so overloaded, he hasn't been able to, you know, to finish his report, which is as soon as he finishes his report, we'll have some cleaner data uh, as far as making a decision uh, for Jen's department, as far as moving um, in, let's say, a new direction. Again, I At see least that's Dan, my observation. I see that Dan has joined us. Um, Selena. Yes, thank you so much. I have a suggestion, but I just, I was missed a lot of the testimony and your subsequent discussion earlier. So I had to be two places at once. So you can tell me if I'm way off base here, but um, in the, I was glad to see that there's meant some discussion here about finding a more sustainable funding model moving forward and not just sort of looking at this as a, crisis moment in budget adjustment. And, um, you know, as I was hearing um, the testimony, it really struck me how um, imperative it is that we sort of start to decouple support for victims and survivors of crimes and their family from the fines and fees and sort of outcomes of, because we don't, we're, we're working really hard through things like justice reinvestment too, to kind of push things in a different direction. And I just wonder if it's worth stating that more explicitly, that that's like a policy that has been a clear policy direction of our committee, um, that we're looking for opportunities 
when appropriate, to, to reduce people's interactions with the criminal justice system through the recom in line with the recommendations of um, projects like the Justice Reinvestment Working Group too, and other initiatives. And we need to kind of come up with more permanent revenue streams that aren't tied to those outcomes. You know, I just wonder if, as we're talking about a sustainable funding model as a policy committee, if we just wanna really put that on the record and be happy to help craft a sentence along those lines, if it would be helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think that makes sense. I, I would support that personally, um, that context. I, I think I was kind of sensing that maybe that's what uh, some of the recommendations, I mean, Dan's with us, we can maybe ask that question, you know, at least in his analysis to this point, even though we don't have a formal report in order to assist us in drafting, you know, our letter, you know, to appropriations, um, if if it's his impression that we're on the right path, you know that that, that could be a little helpful. Is, Barbara, is that what you were getting at in the in the last paragraph of your letter, where it starts with "We also fully understand the importance"? Yes, because yeah. Because one, I got your point about um, policy changes for a budget adjustment and wanted yeah. to say, we're not trying to do that stuff now, but we get why Adam Gresham was asking like, well, what's the plan? Because I'm sure they're not excited on the fifth floor to have, um, if we know this is gonna keep happening, which it sounds like it is, the way to deal with it isn't for the Center for Crime Victims to then come forward with a budget adjustment every year. It's like, it's bad for government. It's bad for the Center for Crime Victim Services. It's bad for their grantees. It's like a bad way to operate, period. Well, but so I got that and I was trying to not confuse people with feeling like particular policies were being... Um, suggested for the budget adjustment. And when Coach and I got to talk during the break, we have that subcommittee that's supposed to be looking at um, a sustainable model. And so it seemed like offering to help moving forward with the budget seemed like a, a way to go, but I'm totally open to every and all change. I was um, obviously doing this super quick. <laughs> Right. And another entity it's bad for is us in judiciary because it's right. putting us in a, it's putting us in an almost in an appropriation uh, position, um, which isn't our job. <laughs> um, right. You know, to really to I mean, it is our job to, to deal with these things, but uh, I, it's just not necessary if the if the funding was done in uh uh, not that it was inappropriate a way to fund in the past, but it's uh, we're running into problems with it and, it and it needs to change. Right. So, um, I'm, again, I'm looking at the time. So, Tom, I'm going to go back to you. Um, uh, and I know we need to have some edits here, but is this something that that for starters, you could support this, um, the memo and the concepts here? Is it strong and yeah. um is it strong enough in terms of ARPA first, um, not doing policy in the BAA? I just want to make sure we capture your concerns. It, it definitely captures my concerns. It, 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 uh, it, uh, uh, it makes it uh, the first look at the ARPA funds, which was the biggest concern. And, and uh, you know, and I, and I realize that the, uh, the, the funding problem isn't the problem of the departments here. It's, you know, it's got, it's not like it's overspending by any means, you know, that, that they're short of money. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's our flaw, you know, and it just wasn't, um, it just wasn't visible in the past. And, uh, and, and it's a weakness that uh, has come to light that needs to change. But, but yeah, I, I can, uh, I can certainly uh, support the way this is. Okay, great. Thank you. And so I think I, I really appreciate that, Tom. And um, and thank you so much, Barbara, for 
for drafting this. So I think what I would like to do is, um, and we could just do a show of hands um, of support for this letter uh, memo, and then um, let Barbara do some edits. If anybody has edits, they can send her away or whatever. But um, is it is it inappropriate to ask if if the administration is is okay with this? If that's what they're looking for. It, I think it's not for the administration, it's for the House Appropriations. Right, so. But well, there will be a number of proposals. There will be a number of proposals throughout the building that are going to be putting put forward right now. And, uh, and, and that's the way it usually works. And, and it, it just comes down to the administration doesn't know what all these proposals are going to be. And they have to see them. To, to decide whether or not they will support something. But, but I, I, this, this program is not in dire straits until they're out of money in on July 1, right? So I would say if, if it's the message, if you felt like you wanted to get one to the administration is, oh my gosh, I sure hope when you're doing your budget for 23, you've got a good plan in place for this for this important service. The budget adjustment I though think, I think we would be out of line because it's got to go to appropriations and yeah. they've got to put yeah. together a package, but mm -hmm. it's not too early to say for the budget for next year, like do, here's, and they probably know that because Adam met <clears throat> with them, but something's got to change. Well, that, that, that's fine. But you know, you know, what I can't stand is something being given to me. And then all of a sudden, I've got a draft right in front of me immediately that I got to make a decision on that I have nothing to make a decision on. I can't, I don't operate like that. And I'm, I'm not supporting that right now. There, I don't think that's fair to anybody to ask to do that right now. In, in in a matter of how many minutes it is. That's just not how I do things. And I'm not going to. Sorry to be uh, so whatever, but you can't, I don't operate like this. So, Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw Dan contemplating a response to the question that we had uh, about because I mean you know he's been studying this and I know that he hasn't had a chance to formalize a report but to get to Selena's point and Tom's point and Barb's about you know our policy piece what are our next steps you know we're trying to move away from some of these crimes and penalties and things of that sort so of course why would we why would we link funding this service to something we're trying to de decrease? You know, there has to be a new stream. And I think that, you know, that's part of that project that Barb was referring to, that a subgroup of us can hopefully work with Dan and Jennifer and her team to come up with, you know, some directions for helping for the 2020, you know, three, uh, because that's that's where the rubber is going to hit the road. You know, we're kind of okay now. We're just putting a, a, a COVID Band-Aid on what's occurred, you know, to, to this point. Just Thank a thought. Um I know Dan, just, for, to... just for the record, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I don't have enough information to go by. Mm -hmm. The administration is going and saying, okay, you know, we've already heard that there, there, there might be enough in, in revenue and then ARPA and all this stuff. It's like, why are we, why are we making a, uh, uh, whatever that word was strong recommendation or whatever it is, feel strongly or whatever it is when I, I don't know how much of it that is 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 really desperate. I haven't seen numbers. I haven't seen anything. So I think again, our our role is less about the numbers, but about the policy that that the um, the services at the center um, provides um, are consistent. Our our priorities, you know, top priorities of this committee. 
in terms of supporting um, victims of crime. And I think that's really what um, is where, where we weigh in and we say, you know, please, Appropriations Committee, please do what you can um, to, keep, um, to keep the center and the programs um, you know, alive and, and sustainable. And then it's up to them to, to look at the numbers, to look, you know, to look where the funding comes from. But we- Ma Ma Madam Chair, I don't wanna be misunderstood. I, I, I support uh, the group. It's just, it's just, I want numbers. I, I wanna know what we're talking about. I'm not just gonna throw um, uh, taxpayers money out just without having more to go on and more direction of, of, of me agreeing to a, to a, a letter that I'm, I'm quite frankly, not, I'm, I'm not going to agree with that yet. I agree with what's going, you know what I mean? I agree with the program. It's just, I don't have enough information, especially in two hours or whatever we've been dealing with this on. Madam Chair, are, are we are we going to be voting on anything today? Because I um, I need to jump off, um, and and I, I don't know if anybody else does. But uh, if we don't need to vote on anything, maybe we can um, continue the discussion another day. Sure. Yeah. No, we we don't need to vote on anything. We do need to try to get an answer to uh, House Appropriations, so we can certainly. Think about this tonight, but again, um, it's House Appropriations' job to look at the numbers and right. to come up with the numbers. It's our right. job to say, you know, this is important policy. The center is important. Please, um, as you're looking through um, requests for budget adjustment, we ask you to put the center um, up top. <laughs> I mean, sort of a simplistic um, summary, but I think that is our our role. Um, so before we adjourn, I don't know if, um, Dan, do you have anything here that you wanted to add? And Bob, I do see your hand, but. Um, I, I do have, I, th I think I could add a lot, but I'm, I'm cognizant that you're running short on time for today. And so I, you know, I think there's, there's certainly a discussion to be had, you know, at least in the short term in lieu of having a report in front of you, as far as, um, you know, what the, what the ongoing need is and a few ideas for how to, how to start to address the need. Um, I, I will say um, up front that um, the report that I issue, given where I am currently, I don't think I'm going to have answers that, that solve the problem in its entirety. I think, you know, my recommendations are going to sort of hinge on um, continuing the, you know, the, the current surcharge provisions and statute um, would have to stay in order to sort of provide the full funding picture, um, you know, and, and, and that's certainly, you know, something that it sounds like you want to get away from. Um, so I, I think there's, it's, you know, it's going to be a longer conversation. Um, and so I, I don't know if that's extremely helpful, but I, I, I want to give you some sense of, of where I'm heading. Um, and. Uh, okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll find time to pick this up again. Um, I do have a meeting, but after my meeting, I can, Jen, I can follow up with you, Barbara, and, and uh, take it from there. So, okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will adjourn and go off of uh, YouTube. Thank you.